Our speaker tonight is Scott Elric. Scott is the section head of the Coal, Bedrock, Geology, and Industrial Minerals section of the Illinois State Geological Survey. He got his bachelor's in geology from the University of Illinois and master's in geophysics from the University of California, Riverside. His research interests include stratigraphy, sedimentology, paleoclimate, paleobotany, coal balls, and depositional history of the Pennsylvanian period and the late Paleozoic Ice Age. His program tonight will be of special, special interest to those who went on the uh, Danville, Catlin uh, field trips to collect from the Heron Coal Roof Shales. The title of his program is The Life and Death of the Heron Peat Swamp, Whys, Whens, and Hows. Scott. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Let me see, I'm gonna try to do a share screen and I'll see if this works. I'll go just to the PowerPoint. Hopefully that will work. Is that coming through okay to everybody, I hope? Very good. Yes, excellent, wonderful, okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so the, um, the kind of the gist of what I wanted to do here was to give context in the sort of the big picture context of uh, the fossils that you've been collecting. And uh, I talked with uh, Bill DeMichael from the Smithsonian, I guess it was a couple of days ago, or no, I'm sorry, a couple of weeks ago, excuse me. And, uh, and the, as, as far as he's aware, as far as I'm aware, no one's ever really done systematic collecting like what you folks are doing right now from those spoil piles. So uh, what you're doing is great. And, and, uh, Keep keep up the keep up the effort and and uh, uh, there may be something to be some hay to be made there certainly on the white on the larger scientific sense so very cool stuff anyway okay <clears throat> so uh, what we're going to do is is kind of take the the big picture view of the whys and the hows and all that and talk about what the controls on um, the the pear and peat swamp and the stratigraphy the rocks above and below. And the aim here is to try to, um, uh, to, to give you a storyline as to from where are you collect, where are the fossils that you're collecting? Where are they coming from? Where are they coming from in the larger climate sense and otherwise? All right, let me get myself, let me move folks off to the right there a little bit. There we go. Oops, oops, sorry. This is on my screen. I'm a little off. There it is. And oh, there it goes. Okay. So big picture first, we're going to talk about, I need to get everybody oriented, so we're going to talk about the coal in Illinois, we're going to talk about sort of the big picture paleogeography uh, of where we were, what the climate sort of situation was like, and we're going to establish a, a depositional model for the Pennsylvanian coals uh, in the Illinois basin. And we're actually going to use uh, the Springfield coal as sort of our, our analog. We just have a, a publication that just came out here, ISGS Circular 605. Uh, that I'll be pulling a lot of this content from. And what this is going to do is we're going to use that to sort of demonstrate the big picture. And this is exactly the model that will apply to the uh, hair and coal as well. This is a lovely reconstruction here uh, on the bottom of uh, what these peat swamps likely looked like. And the, uh, the, green, the green bark, uh, Kirk Johnson did this uh, when he was at the Denver Museum. Uh, the, the green that you're seeing on the outside is, uh, is, is likely correct and that the uh, uh, the outsides of these uh, lycopods were photosynthetic. It's pretty cool. All right, so we're going to go. The, how we get into uh, this sort of a picture is we're actually going to go, we're going into the mine because, uh, or going into a coal mine because that's where a lot of the sort of the generation of the ideas behind what are these coal seams comes from. So this is a little silly, I suppose, but we're we're gearing up. We're going into the mine. We're going to take a close look at the stratigraphy that is there. I know it's a little silly, but. Uh, one of the cool things about doing research uh, in a coal mine or within the, the, the within the confines of a coal mine is that it's a little it's orthogonal to how we often look at uh, 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 geology. Usually, we're looking at you know a huge amount of time, but a small geographic slice. Here's an example, of course, from the uh, um, uh, Grand Canyon. So it's millions of years in one shot that you're looking at here, but you're only seeing you know only a fraction of that landscape at, at any one moment. When you're in a coal mine, though. Uh, you're seeing large geographic areas and very small time slices, sort of what we sometimes call T0 or, or time zero, instantaneous sorts of deposits. So we're seeing landscapes that are becoming visible and a worm's eye view of those intervals. Uh, what that means then is we're able to capture when we have great exposures, really interesting relationships. So let me sort of 
kind of get your eye attuned to what you're seeing here. Uh, can everybody see my mouse, I hope? Yeah, okay, great. So uh, this is a Bill to Michael from the Smithsonian on the left here um, for scale. Uh, what you're seeing, the, the black shiny material that you're seeing from here on down, that is a coal seam. From here on up, that is uh, a shale. And this right here is an upright tree. So what you're looking at is an entombed tr a tree that has been entombed by sediment uh, and capturing it in place. Uh, there's some interesting uh, uh, features in the sedimentology or in the sediments that are adjacent to that tree that we'll come back to in a, a, a picture a little bit later uh, that, that gives us some context for this. Uh, it also means you can get situations like this, uh, again, coal from here on down, uh, a gray shale above, and what you see in the circular outline right there, this is John Nelson, one of my colleagues at the uh, Geological Survey, uh, that is what some, sometimes is called a kettle bottom, and what that is is the bottom side of the flaring out base uh, of a uh, upright uh, lycopod tree, uh, sometimes called a widow maker too. Uh, because the flared out base means that it doesn't have that much support. So those tend to fall out from the ceiling. So putting roof bolts through there is usually what they, if they, they do if they can find it or if they see it. Uh, but the thing to consider about coal, which is so interesting to me anyway, it, it's an organic deposit. So you can think of it in a sense like a terrestrial coral reef. So it's in the geologic record, it's a rock that kind of can defy gravity in a sort of a gravity driven sense. You know, you think of uh, sediments being deposited, you're always thinking of things flowing downhill, you know, filling basins, eroding off of mountains and heading down rivers. But, but peat and the, the, the plants can defy that, they can, they can move beyond that. So it's important to think about coal uh, as just that, uh, it's almost a reef-like deposit. By the way, this is another uh, upright tree here, John Nelson again, coal from there on down, and that tree was rooting down. We're just catching the edge of it right there, rooting down into the top of the coal seam. How does coal form? Probably everybody knows this, but just to get everybody on the same uh, uh, path here, or the same track, uh, we need to have a peat swamp of some sort uh, that is uh, covered over in sediment as time continues on, and pressure is applied, water comes out, heat is applied, and there's a variety of chemical reactions that uh, take place where you uh, take the original organic material and uh, uh, heat it, cook it, uh, get out all the water, all the volatiles, and it becomes uh, goes through various stages to become coal. How does peat form? Because you need to start with a peat swamp. And basically what, in its most basic form, you need to have a, a, a wet environment where, you, where the rate of accumulation of plant debris is faster than the rate at which it decomposes and is transported out of the area. So that plant debris can then be preserved as peat potentially, which could potentially be turned into coal, but you gotta be able to bury it. If you can't bury it, it will, it will just evaporate off the landscape because it will oxidize very quickly if it becomes dry and you can't bury it quickly. So the super big picture first, this is a, a map of the United States showing the coal fields of the, uh, of the US. Uh, the oranges are their tertiary lignites and otherwise. Uh, what we're interested in are the Pennsylvanian age, the Carboniferous coal deposits in the Illinois Basin. There's the Appalachians and sort of the Western Interior Basins through there. Uh, zooming into Illinois, uh, where is it in Illinois? So the coal seams in Illinois follow the trend of the Illinois Basin. We've got maybe, I say approximately because it depends on how you, you count them up, about 50 named coals in the Illinois Basin. Uh, or in Illinois, uh, 27 of them would be considered resources at some level. Uh, and seven of them would actually be considered important for mining, uh, Danville, Jamestown, Heron, et cetera. Uh, the bulk of what we extract or what has been extracted has come from the, the Heron and the Springfield coals. Uh, a fun little visualization, hopefully this will come through, the video will come through, uh, ridiculously vertically exaggerated, but the only reason why I like to do this and I think actually for Earth Sciences Club, you don't need to see this. You already know this, but it's fun to show anyway, uh, that these coal seams are nested on top of each other. The, the, the shape of the rocks in, in Illinois is the basin or is a basinal shape. So these, these uh, coal seams are, are nested one inside of each other like mixing bowls. So how much coal do we have in Illinois? Uh, you can do a variety of methods of, of calculating this. One thing that you do is you take a look at what are the restrictions, uh, you know, coal that is too thin, 
too too deep, uh, too much too 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 little uh, rock on top of it, so that you can't support the roof. A whole variety of restrictions, uh, and you come up with something around 96 billion tons of coal, most of it in the Hare and Springfield coal seams. So that's huge. It's the BTU equivalent of, uh, of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait together in terms of their oil resources. Hopefully, none of it can, needs to be uh, burned, or very little of it, because they're obviously uh, burning coal is a is a CO2 intensive process. So my my hope is that we don't have to burn much of it all. But what's interesting is that there's the potential there for rare earth elements within coal seams. Peat is sort of a natural sponge. And um, the byproducts of the burning of coal, but also in the coal itself, uh, are rare earth elements that may be there and uh, might be of significant interest uh, for us in the future. Uh, even potentially lithium and things of that nature for not only uh, uh, not only for batteries and uh, lithium batteries for uh, things of that nature, but uh, rare earths for renewable energy sources, you know, wind turbines, solar panels. So who knows? The coal may be something that will. Be continue to be extracted in Illinois, but for different reasons, not for burning. So the sort of the bigger picture that we're going to be revolving around here are is this: what are the climate controls on stratigraphy? And we're going to tunnel down into uh, looking at the Pennsylvania of Illinois. What was the climate? What was the setting? What are the conditions that the Illinois Basin coals were deposited under? What were the circumstances? Uh, and actually, in parentheses here, I'm pointing out that. Um, Wanless and Weller of the 1930s uh, developed this, uh, this concept of cyclothems, regular repeating patterns of rock. And they really provided the first conceptual frameworks, which uh, the science of uh, science sequence stratigraphy that's utilized in geology was sort of started from. Um, and uh, so there's a, actually a long history here. And we're going to go into the, the whys and wherefores of why you get these regular repeating patterns uh, of, of the, in the stratigraphy. And I'm going to actually shortchange myself and go to the very end. <laughs> in a way, the story we're going to talk about here and what we're sort of developing um, is uh, a, a storyline that was put together by Blaine Cecil at the USGS and SEPM Special Pub uh, 77. I think it was 2003 is when that came out. Uh, and what we're going to show is how the interaction of climate and eustacy, meaning sea level rise and fall, really is what is the primary control of the deposition of the rocks, uh, Pennsylvania rocks here, and the Heron coal. So that's where we'll circle back around. On the right is a, 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 a um, uh, stratigraphic column that's representative of, of uh, the Pennsylvania, or a portion of it anyway. And we're going to be looking at the Springfield coal in detail, which is here, and I'll, we'll zoom in on these as well. And the Heron coal is just above it right there. All right. Oops. There it goes. So uh, coal in Illinois, when was it deposited? Uh, as I don't need to remind anybody here as to the geologic column uh, from zero to 4.6 billion years here. We're looking here, the Paleozoic is, uh, sorry, Paleozoic is there, Carboniferous is here. So we're looking just at about 300 and 320 to 350 million years. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, it's too late. Uh, 290, oh, here I have on the right, <laughs> 290 to 320 uh, is about when our, our major coals are, are uh, deposited. Uh, so of those 50 named seams, 90% of our mineable coal is in the Heron and Springfield, as you can see here. And uh, if nobody, I'm, folks probably know, but just as an FYI, uh, these when we name these coal seams and naming uh, uh, throughout the basin, uh, in most cases, it's, uh, it is... Uh, uh, being named after a location. So Heron, Illinois, and Springfield, Illinois as the type localities. So the, the, um, the larger context, to, to understand our, where, why our coal seams are where they are, we're going to take a look at the paleogeography and paleoclimate and read these rocks. We're going to go backwards and see what the landscape was like, and plate tectonics gives us the tools. So just a quick reminder, with the Earth's crust has plates that move. We've got convergent boundaries where the one plate dives under the other. You've got divergent boundaries where the plates are created uh, and uh, transform faults as well. And just as a reminder on all those motions there, I, I feel, this is a talk that I've given elsewhere or use these in other contexts. I, I, obviously, you folks know this, but that's OK. I'll, we'll show it anyway. So we're going to run that clock backwards. And uh, if anyone's a Doctor Who fan, 
You can make your TARDIS sounds effects right now and we'll go back in time. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna run the clock backwards here to uh, uh, the, the Cambrian and then we're gonna come back forward and see where we were at the Pennsylvania. So these images are, are, are actually, they're older uh, from Ron, Blake, uh, Ron Blakey. And uh, I really like the way he put this together because, uh, or this older version, uh, because I really like the way the globes uh, uh, are, are constructed. Uh, Scotese does wonderful stuff and is, is definitely, I think, more accurate <laughs> in terms of the reconstructions than Blakey, but I like the, uh, the, the art artistry of what Blakey does. And for these purposes, it's fine. So anyway, let's run the clock backwards here. 20 million years, we're gonna take us back. Late Eocene, 80 million years. 130, 150, 160, and then my joke, my my one uh, paleo tech, or, uh, paleogeography joke is that if you're ever going to swim the Atlantic Ocean, there it is right there. This is the time to do it. Ha ha. That's the, it's a good thing everyone's muted, so I don't have to hear the groans. <laughs> All right, 220, late Triassic, moving backwards. Early Permian, Pangaea, and all that good stuff, and all sorts of excitement going on there. And we're going to come back to the closer in view here, the late pen of 300 million. Let's just keep walking the clock backwards, 340, 370, early Devonian, 400 million, 430 at the middle Silurian, later Revision, 480 at the early, 500 late Cambrian, and 550 early Cambrian. I love watching those go backwards just because it I think it really helps to put things in context when thinking about the past and looking at rocks and thinking about rocks is where were you? It does matter. So uh, let's now run the clock forward. Uh, what was the geographic setting of Illinois and the Pennsylvanian 300 million years ago? Make your TARDIS sound effects again. Let's go in a more zoomed in view. Uh, so what things you can see here is that this is uh, this line that goes across here with a zero, that is the uh, equator. Uh, this is a North American craton. You can get the rough view of the uh, outlines of the U.S. states, in this case, rotated on its side. I have Illinois uh, highlighted here in yellow. And what we're going to do is walk the clock forward, and we'll run us up to the Pennsylvania. And uh, the things to keep in mind is that, of course, we're starting off here below the equator. So uh, early Cambrian. Middle Cambrian, five cent. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, the way to read these color schemes. The dark blue would be deep water. The light blue would be shallow inland seas. Uh, the, of course, this would be, uh, this is supposed to represent um, uh, land. So Middle Cambrian. Uh, early Ordovician, 470, Taconic Orogeny. You've got this island arc system out here on our eastern seaboard uh, that is uh, colliding with the North American craton coming up from the south and suturing together. Uh, causing mountain building to come along here. Uh, I believe, uh, I think Acadia, I think Acadia National Park out in Maine, I believe, has, uh, has evidence and remnants of the Taconic Orogeny. Here we go, later division, the, that, that Orogeny has kind of taken place, that island arc system is plastered on our eastern seaboard. Uh, you can see the North American Craton is rotating counterclockwise a little bit. We've got some more subduction zones off this way and another uh, uh, a craton coming our way with another island arc system that is heading our way. Early Silurian, the Acadian orogeny. Again, another suture zone is going to zip itself shut here, and we're going to another uh, another slice of uh, of, of uh, crust uh, amalgamated to us. And here we go, early Devonian. That Acadian orogeny continues along. The zipper is zipping shut. And we are still at 30 degrees south, but sort of rotating counterclockwise uh, just a little bit. Late Devonian, what you're seeing coming in out of the south, and actually it was the case in the slide before, is we've got the African and South African, excuse me, South American uh, cratons uh, coming up from the south, and they're going to impact us, uh, North American craton, and shove us north. I will go one more slot here. The 340 million early Mississippian. You've got the uh, beginnings of the amalgamation of Pangaea. The Appalachian or Alle Allegheny orogeny is happening here. Big, big mountain building events that are starting up now. Uh, and you can see that we've been shoved northwards and we're approaching uh, the equator. Here we go, late Pennsylvanian. This is when our Illinois coals are deposited. We'll put some names on these here. 
Oh, whoops. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, so the Appalachian or uh, orogeny has uh, been is going full force. We've got big mountains that have been forming and uh, are, are forming. Uh, so the Appalachians out here, Persinians out this way, Wachita's, the ancestral Rockies have been pushed up here, and a shallow inland seaway called the Absaroka Sea. So the the important things we want to take off uh, take from from this uh, is that Illinois was at the equator in the late Pennsylvanian. Uh, you had mountains off to the east and to our south a little bit too. You had uh, drainage of this of the craton bringing large amounts of sediment uh, down these river systems and depositing out into the shallow Absaroka Seaway. So the other thing, uh, that is a reminder that we're gonna come back to. This is showing uh, uh, two different orbits of planet Earth around the sun. And we're gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, specifically, this is going to relate to uh, glacial interglacial cycles. And the thing that we're going to get to, and I'm, uh, I'm going ahead of myself a little bit, uh, is the idea of as, as glacial cycles occur, sea level goes up and down. And as sea level goes up and down, that coastline marches back and forth across the craton. And that will be important to our rest of our story here. In fact, uh, it's important enough that it ends up painting the, uh, the landscape uh, over time. And this picture here of uh, John Nelson looking at uh, these, these layer cake stratigraphy of, of rocks at a, at, at a surface mine in Southern Illinois uh, is to indicate that uh, this is the kind of painting that's occurring as sea level goes up and down. And we'll get into the details of that here in just a second. All right, let's take us all the way to the, uh, close to the modern day and, and run the clock all the way out here. I like to look at these, uh, these uh, uh, um, reconstructions just because it, it's really cool to sort of think about how, uh, how things have evolved over time and, and, and where we're ending up. There's a whole other talk to talk about <laughs> on this, and I would love to spend the time, but uh, we won't do that with the given time that we've got. Okay, so I'm going to give you four pieces to tell this story, and we're going to integrate this into, into a storyline. Piece number one, where were we uh, 300 million years ago? At the equator. Uh, the joke that I have done before is uh, uh, not only where we at the equator, if we were in the room together, I would then say, oh yeah, in fact, it went right here. You can see it right there. Anyway, uh, okay, piece number two. Uh, this is an interesting diagram, and what it shows is the relationship between climate, specifically rainfall, and the amount of evaporation, evapotranspiration that's occurring, and the amount of sediment that moves on that landscape. Here's how you read this. So on the y-axis, this is the potential to yield sediment. In other words, how much sediment might move on that landscape. And on the x-axis, this is the number of months when the amount of rainfall or water in exceeds that of the water out. Here's the way you would look at it, is that when you have a situation like this here, we have monsoonal situations, wet seasons and dry seasons. And when you have that, you end up, you, the, the landscape can produce large amounts of sediment. If, on the other hand, you have a situation where the rain, it's raining way much more of the time than it is not, in other words, uh, a rainforest sort of situation, daily rainfalls or ever wet conditions, this is where you have the opportunity to move very little sediment. And as it turns out, this is also uh, the potentials for whether or not you're going to be able to have peat formation or uh, uh, standing water such that you're able to form a swamp. Uh, or not having a swamp, i.e. no peat. And there's another way to look at this too. This is from a paper I was a part of a couple of years ago with Blaine Cecil. This is another way to look at it. This is the same sort of a chart here, uh, indicating number of, of wet months and the sediment yield. You can flip this around and look at it the other way as well. When you have uh, drier conditions, uh, the probability of having chemical sediments, in other words, like limestones or pedogenic carbonates uh, evaporates, increases, uh, the potential to have those sorts of rocks when you have monsoonal conditions, wet seasons, dry seasons, uh, you, it decreases and the amount of plastics, the potential for those increase. Uh, and then of course you run it off here to the right where as you increase the amount of overall humidity, the amount of rainfall into the system, you get another type of chemical rock. Like I said, it's like uh, it's like a terrestrial, uh, uh, a terrestrial uh, reef, if you will, uh, is peat. Okay, that's piece two. Piece three. Uh, there's a really cool paper that came out a couple of years ago 
that was able to age date uh, coals in the Donetsk Basin uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. And what's so neat about this is that they have rocks that are of the same age that we've got. And uh, you've got limestones that are intercalated into that deposit that you can correlate the conodonts and other uh, uh, and with other biostratigraphy back to the same rocks here in the Illinois Basin and in, and in the United States. What's so neat is that there, were act, there was active volcanism occurring around this Donetsk Basin rift through here. As a result, not only can you have limestones and coals that you can trace with, with uh, 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 biostratigraphy across the world, but in this location, you've actually got uh, ashes that you can age date as well. Really cool. So we can, we, we, what we can see is that these coals are showing up somewhere between 40 to 100,000, oops, I, that was a misspelling, should be 100K, <laughs> uh, uh, 40 to 100,000 years uh, are showing up uh, on that sort of regularity. So what's the, the cause of that periodicity? Well, glaci glaciations due to earth orbit fluctuations, i.e. Milankovitch cycles, which we'll talk about next, are right in that same time period. So uh, Milankovitch cycles, this is where the idea here is that uh, as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, you have a, a variety of different ways that it can do so. There's, there's uh, precession, which is wobbling, there's the tilting, uh, the obliquity, and then the eccentricity. And these are also operating on those same sorts of time scales. Uh, and this is Mr. Milankovitch uh, here up on the top right. Okay, so piece number four, uh, we're gonna talk about climate on planet Earth, and specifically something called the intertropical conversion zone. So this is a modern day Earth. This shows uh, Hadley cells, these, these uh, organized uh, bodies of atmospheric circulation. Uh, and at the equator, the doldrums, if you will, is a, a, the band of intense moisture called the intertropical conversion zone. It goes right through here. I think I've got this one. Hopefully it will start moving. There it goes. Maybe it didn't. Oh, I guess it didn't. No, never, never mind. Okay. So this is a uh, this this shows uh, thunderstorms in the modern day intertropical convergence zone, and the position of that ITCZ uh, oscillates from the winter to the summer. So in the winter time, it's generally down here, and in the summertime, it shifts up just a little bit and it runs up here. So in other words, the position of the that band of moisture oscillates uh, uh, up and down. Uh, excuse me north and south uh, on a yearly basis. Okay, oops, sorry, I just moved, so there it goes, okay. <clears throat> so let's put these things together. Uh, what I'm showing to you here um, is uh, uh, a, a figure from uh, Blaine Cecil's uh, 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 paper from 2003. And the reason why we went through the paleogeographic uh, uh, exercise is because hopefully uh, this is somewhat familiar looking in terms of the, uh, the geographic extent of uh, the continents 300 million years ago in the Pennsylvania. Uh, I've put a red and yellow dot uh, here to indicate the present where the Illinois basin is approximately. And uh, this is the position of the intertropical convergence zone. And we're gonna be very specific about this. This is during interglacial times. And let's go through the storyline of what this is like. So in the summertime, uh, the position of the ITCZ is up. Oops, there it goes. And in the wintertime, it comes down. So that means for us sitting at the, in the Illinois basin 300 million years ago, when you would have no ice at the poles, we would see a band of moisture basically oscillate past us going uh, going uh, wet season when it's here, and then it would come up here, it'd be the dry season, it would come back, it'd be the wet season, the dry season, back and forth, back and forth. So that means during interglacial times when there's no ice, it's seasonal conditions at the equator, monsoonal dry and wet seasons, and this is a great time to be able to erode and move sediment. All right. You can uh, map this out in terms of uh, what, or I should model it, I should say, in terms of what the wetness uh, might have might have looked like. Uh, this is an approximation of what, where the equator was, and of course here's Illinois. Uh, it was it was we were probably something like uh, six to eight, five to seven, however you wanted to to, to put it, uh, months of the year when we would have uh, 
uh, rain. So that would put us out here on this, this uh, sediment yield curve. So when you have ice, the modeling indicates that when you have ice at the poles, and there was probably sea ice up here, but, it's, but we don't have a record of that. The modeling indicates there it was likely there. Uh, but without having land up there uh, to be able to record that, it, you just it, we just don't know, but it's probably the case. Anyway, uh, what occurs is that the presence of those ice masses uh, constrains these, these Hadley cells. And by doing so, the position of that ITCZ, that band of moisture, gets constrained. And the wintertime excursion southward is blocked. So when you've got ice at the poles, at the equator, it's not wet season, dry season, it's wet season all the time. And you can model that out as well. And it's probably plotting up somewhere in the 10 to 11 months out of the year, we have more rain in than out. Uh, and that would put us up somewhere here. And actually, I should go back to this for a second. There was a paper that just came out, um, let's see, I guess it was three weeks ago. Uh, Mateus, I believe his last name was, anyway, uh, some of the modeling is indicating, some of the more recent climate modeling is indicating that uh, in addition to this model being consistent, it may actually have been much colder than we had anticipated at the, in the equatorial zones uh, during glacial maxes or during glacial maxima. You know, our, that I've often said that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, geologists and people who enjoy the earth sciences, what we do is we share a, um, a, a shared commensal hallucination, if you will, of what the past looked like. You know, we all construct these images in our head of, of what the past was working like and looking like, and it's a, it's a consensual uh, hallucination that we all have. Anyway, part of our consensual hallucination that we have, I think for many of us, of the, of the um, um, uh, Carboniferous and of the Pennsylvanian specifically, is we think of the hot, you know, steamy, tropical, jungle-like conditions to form these, these peat swamps. And I think that's in, the, I think that's in question now. Uh, it, you certainly just don't throw things out without lots of evidence, and, but the evidence is growing that it may actually have been much cooler than what we anticipated or what we sort of originally had considered. Um, much work remains to be done, but the models are, are starting to indicate that that could be the case. Anyway, I didn't intend to talk about that, but uh, that just came to mind. I think it's worth worth knowing about anyway. Okay, uh, so uh, during these glacial uh, uh, time frames, when you've got ice uh, at the at the South Pole and likely at the North, you have humid conditions at the equator, low pressure systems at the equator. At the equator means lots of rain and moisture, lush vegetation, and very low sediment transport, and that gives you your potential to form peat. So let's put this all together into a chart. Uh, and what we're gonna do is talk about what's, what's happening in the landscape, what's happening with polar ice, sea level, what kind of rocks are, uh, climate and sediment, and then what rocks are actually being deposited. So let's start uh, in, a, in the interglacials. So no ice at this case, and I'm, I'm indicating that here with no ice on the pole. So if there's no ice at the poles, that means sea level is relatively high. You got seasonal conditions in the tropics, so sediment is moving. And this is when deltas build out into the basins. And that means with the rocks, uh, so erosion in the uplands, basin deposition, we are depositing clastics. I'm showing this as a uh, delta, so upward coarsening sequences. Let's form some ice. Let's go through a, a glacial interval here. As the ice begins to build, sea level begins to fall. As sea level falls, that means that the landscape is exposed. So rivers start to incise, soil start to form, land starts to, to drain. Uh, on the global sense, global climate is cooling. Uh, the tropics become somewhat less seasonal. And as the sea level drops below the land surface, uh, this is when you're forming, cutting rivers and they're meandering and soils are forming. Let's keep that ice uh, formation on. We're gonna go to the glacial maxima. So we have lots of ice, sea level's at its lowest. Uh, you have uh, maximum polar ice means lots of equatorial precipitation. So vegetation density increases, it traps sediment, rising base level from all the rainfall and those subsiding basins may, means you've got the chance to make peat. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is when we're forming our coal, our coal seams, uh, our, our, major, uh, our major coal seams. 
Okay, so here's something I haven't talked about yet, but we're going to get to it right now. The end of glacial uh, cycles tend to be fairly quick. Uh, they're called glacial terminations. And it, it, what it appears is that the buildup of ice is slower than the melt off. It's, it's likely to be because of a sort of tipping point phenomena. You warm the climate enough, it, 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 the, there's a sort of residual heat that is built in, built in, built in, and then it goes and it melts quickly. So what happens is that as the climate warms, it warms rapidly, there's a, a shift that occurs quickly. The ice caps melt fairly quickly. And that means that because the ice caps are melting fast, that means that uh, there's a quick change in, in the climate at the equator from wet to seasonal. And that means that your vegetation density decreases, it thins out, and all of this backlog of sediment that had been trapped by the vegetation in the uplands now is released. It's released and it comes down the river systems. And because sea level is rising, because ice is melting, uh, that gives you the opportunity to have rising sea level with sediment in it that goes up and over on top of the peat swamps, covering the peat. That's how you're able to trap vegetation in place so quickly. So a landscape purge and ocean floods the land. All right, well, this is a cycle because it's part of these glaciation cycles. Let's continue to melt the ice. And as it does, as you do that, sea level continues to come up and you end up getting uh, black shales and limestones as sea level continues to go up. Uh, melt the ice completely. The shoreline is way up in the Appalachian. Sea level's at its highest. Uh, this is, we're back to the beginning. Uh, seasonal conditions in the tropics, uh, deltas are way off in the Appalachians. They start building their way out into the basins uh, and it's upland erosion, erosion basin deposition again. That is one cycle, one glacial interglacial cycle. So I'm, I'm going to summarize it, but we're going to get a little more in detail because I really want to show sort of what this means in terms of preserving these, preserving plants. Uh, so cold deposition Illinois is really controlled by this repeating interplay of climate, sedimentation, uh, used to see sea level, and that is expressed on a very broad flat landscape. And that broad flat landscape means that you're, you end up as sea level goes up and down and the coastline goes back and forth, you're painting the landscape back and forth with these, with these alternating layers. So we're going to get into a little more detail of this stratigraphy right in here. Uh, to sort of see how this actually plays out. Why are we showing these big uh, channels that are cutting down in? What are these, how do these things relate in? I'm gonna get to that next. Okay, so let's pull this out. We're gonna take a look at the Springfield coal through here. Uh, this is the, uh, a channel that has been incised down into the uh, deltaic deposits below. Uh, called, this is the Galatia sandstone. Uh, the Springfield coal adjoins on either side of this channel, but it does not pass through and across because it was uh, it was Pena contemporaneous. Uh, uh, the channel was Pena con contemporaneous with the Springfield coal deposition. The other thing we're going to look at uh, this. Where's my mouse? There it is. Uh, this sort of a uh, lozenge shaped body is called the Dikersburg shale. That is a quote gray shale, and we'll talk about where that fits in. That is that that is that landscape purge shale that uh, shale that are the sediment that is coming out of the out of the landscape as the climate changes. And where's my mouse again? There it is. The Turner Mine Shale here is a black shale. That's part of the sea level rise. And uh, St. David Limestone, uh, that is also, that's the continuation of that. So we're gonna get into the details of what that list looks like. And a little advertisement. Uh, the content that I'm showing here is coming from a circular that we just put out uh, just, I guess, a couple months ago, actually, at this point. No, I guess the 2020 is the official pub, anyway. That's where this is coming from. Uh, you can download it for free. And of course, if you want the plates for whatever reason, you can uh, purchase that too. So there you go. Uh, so we're gonna put this together and to see the climate and used to see dance in action. So this is a uh, coal thickness map of the Springfield coal. We'll show another one at the end of the Heron coal. Uh, we're gonna zoom in to this area down here. And just to give you a heads up on the color schemes and what this is, I think I can go there. Yeah, there it is. So this is a, the zoom in here. Uh, this is a coal thickness. The darker the green, the thicker the coal. Uh, so this is coal that is six, whoops, where's my mouse? Uh, there it is, 66 inches or greater, 42 to 66 inches, and then uh, lesser still. Uh, those numbers came about because the USGS had those as categories, so that's what was adopted. Uh, the brown indicates underground coal mines. 
And the reason why we've studied the spring field is because we're able to go into these vines to be able to sample as we went and observe these things. The other map I want to show you here, oh, sorry, the yellow that you see through here, that is the Galatia Channel. And that is that, that channel that we were uh, taking a look at right there. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to point out here too is that there's actually, there's uh, the sediment below the, the Springfield coal uh, is this map here, the sandstone uh, below the, uh, the below the Springfield. I superimposed in yellow the trace of the Galatia Channel there. And what you're seeing here, that one to almost one-to-one -one correlation uh, is indicating uh, uh, it's part of the history. This was a active river channel system below that got constrained by peat formation trapping uh, the Galatia Channel in place. All right, let's go on to the, the next stuff here. Oh, the other one I wanted to show here too. This is, this is the Dikersberg Shale. This is that gray shale above. The, the gray colors here, the dark gray and the light gray. Uh, darker gray is, is, excuse me, shale that's 20 feet or more in thickness. Uh, the light gray is uh, 20 feet and below. Uh, those numbers were actually turned out to be important because it, when the shale, the gray shale was greater than 20 feet, uh, that's where low sulfur coal could be found. Uh, and obviously that was an issue for when, uh, when uh, <laughs> I still now too, uh, to try to be able to, to trying to be able to find lower sulfur coal. Uh, okay, so, uh, and this is the same story will apply to the Heron coal. We're gonna come back to this picture at the end. Uh, this is the Walshville channel running through there. Same idea with the colors, the dark green, darker greens are the thicker coal, uh, the lighter uh, are, the, are the thinner. Uh, the light green to the yellow to the pink is the, is the continuation of the ramp. Okay, so here's where we're putting that, that sequence of, of, uh, of actions into a sea level curve and, uh, or I should say a representation of the sea level curve. Let me sort of describe this. So what we're trying, what I'm trying to show here is that the dashed line here is sort of the estimated elevation of what the Illinois Basin would have been like roughly speaking, 300 million years ago. The blue line is sea level. So the way to view this is that as time goes from left to right, so you're going forward in time this way, uh, this red lozenge is supposed to indicate kind of where are we in that glacial interglacial cycle. And I, though I haven't put it on here directly, when you have seasonal climates, that's the interglacial, no ice, so sea level's high. The humid or per-humid climate down here is when you have glacial intervals. So when you have glaciers, you have lots of ice, sea level is low. So we're going to march through a series of steps. That red lozenge is going to march its way down and up this sea level curve to indicate where we are going uh, through time. Okay, so here's a block diagram of the first step uh, in, our, in our process here. So there's the red lozenge. It's above the level of the Illinois Basin, meaning its sea level is above the level of the Illinois Basin. And the way to look at this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, a coal, a black shale, and a limestone of the, of the cycle before. And the first thing that happens is that deltas are prograding into the basin. Sea level is high. You've got sediment that's evulsing out of the landscape and out, off the mountains. Uh, the deltas build out into the basin. And this is where we form our thick packages uh, of, uh, of plastics. The next thing we're doing, the lozenge has gone down here. So sea level is now below the level of the Illinois Basin. That means uh, that we've exposed the landscape. We're down cutting into the landscape. So channel incision is occurring. It's cutting down into those previous delta sediments. You get you know, riverbank slumps, uh, conglomerate lags, all sorts of stuff. And on the, the larger landscape, you're forming soils. And these soils are forming under seasonal climates, wet, dry climates. And those generally are forming vertisols. Okay, uh, this is the landscape that is represented, not by the yellow, remember that, that's where I superimposed the later Galatia Channel, but this is the landscape that we're talking about here, this pre-existing landscape where you've got uh, a meander belts where the river's uh, going back and forth within a, within a system, soils are forming on this landscape. Uh, next, uh, I move the lozenge down a little bit, base level starting to, to drop out, things are becoming slightly wetter, uh, this, you've got the meander valleys that are forming in size valleys that are, are transporting mostly local sediment. But because the climate is wetting, that means that you're getting an overprint on these soils because the wetting climate starts to strip out iron and it turns these soils gray. 
that's where you get these typical gray underclays is because uh, the iron is being stripped out because of that change in climate. It's becoming wetter and wetter. All right, uh, the, lozenge, the lozenge continues down, climate continues to get wetter. And as, this, as the climate gets wetter, the landscape pollutifies, which is a great word, meaning you're starting to form ponds. So low areas in the landscape start to develop uh, peat. Those begin a sort of initiation or nucleation sites, if you will, where the peat can then, uh, or that, that swamp can build out from there. Uh, the channel margins accumulate the peat very early and it constrains the migration and it locks the banks in place. That's why that yellow uh, uh, trace of the glacier channel was hemmed in within that meander system. So uh, the other thing that's happening is that the, the river itself becomes sediment poor because there's so much vegetation. It traps and holds on to all that vegetation, excuse me, all that sediment. Uh, the other thing is that uh, these the drowned soils uh, now, because of the ever wet climates, you've drowned it, and now you've changed over uh, to a histosol, which is peat. All right, I've purposely made this uh, much broader than it probably really is to, to evoke some uncertainty. But during glacial max, this is when we've got the maximum amount of, of rainfall in the equatorial zones. Uh, you've got um, peat enveloping the landscape. Every so often uh, along the river channel uh, edges, you're getting little floods that are bringing in little clays, dark silty clays, just thin little uh, intrusions. Uh, not much because really the, 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 sediment in, the sediment load in the river is almost to nothing because of the, the um, immense amount of rainfall. It seems counterintuitive, but the immense amount of rainfall doesn't mean huge amounts of sediment if there's a bunch of vegetation as, as well. Okay, now we're going to glacial termination. This termination phase, and you'll notice that it's it's going to that I, I draw this line very steep, and that's to indicate that glacial termination being rapid. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, this is what it looks like uh, up close to the uh, up to the chan up uh, close to the channel margin. Uh, you can see that there is this intercalation of uh, bright bands of peat between duller gray bands of sediment. This is this uh, this uh, periodic flooding that goes on there. Uh, so that is this sort of a stage that you're seeing right here. Here's the, the peat swamp and the greens, the yellow of the Galatia Channel. Okay, so during deglaciation, we're, we're rapidly rising sea levels. Uh, what happens is that as, this, as sea level rises, and it's happening fairly quickly, uh, you end up getting a couple of interesting things that happen. The climate changes at the same time. That increase in seasonality means that the vegetation density inland goes down. That means that vegetation that was initially holding down uh, sediment, or I should say sediment that was on the landscape, the vegetation was holding in place, uh, it can now no longer hold it in place. And that evulses into the drainages and into the river systems. At the same time, uh, as the sea level is rising, you have tidal bores that are working their way inland up these river systems, turning the rivers into estuaries. So the peat margin, the channel margin at the, at the margin, it's ripped into by those tides and it winnows away those interlaminated muds and it leaves peat flaps like fingers, if you will. And those flaps uh, can then float because of trapped gas and the, the, the continued uh, vertical movement from the tide comes in, it floats it up, tide goes out, it comes back down. Uh, that continued repeated action actually peels away some of those, those peat layers into sheets and those gaps can then be infilled by mud and silt and creating splits adjacent to the channel. So let's take a look at that. Here's the first relationship. This is this, uh, this changeover. This, uh, I should say, sorry, on the left, this is the channel margin. You can see faint edges, faint lines of black. Uh, those are that, that the channel margin of peats with the, uh, the, the uh, uh, gray clays intercalated in between. And this is the, the uh, a uh, deglaciation seasonal, seasonal uh, flux, uh, a seasonality flux of sediment into this river system, chewing away uh, and into the edges of that channel. And in fact, you can get a sense of this right here. This is the, this is the sediment, uh, and sorry, the, uh, uh, the situation when the uh, peat was being formed. This is the climate change sediment and it's eroding into and winnowing away 
that uh, 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 that the uh, the clays in between the peat flaps, and that expands out and eventually starts turning into things like this, where the peat is actually torn and ripped asunder because of the gas bubbles, uh, the methane that's entrapped within those within those peats. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. There's a lot of neat stories uh, to be told about that as well. If you want a different talk at a later time. Okay, uh, the other thing that's happening here then too is that as this river turns into uh, an estuary, it's fill, filled with sediment. Uh, that sediment eventually pushes out and overtops into the into the swamp, into the mire, and it pushes down and it dewaters the peat, and that peat compacts down, making more space. Uh, for that sediment, which then rapidly accumulates. And I will show a picture of that in just a section, in just a second. Uh, that peat ripping action continues further upstream as the system moves further upstream. Uh, and also that tidal action going back and forth, it actually pounds into the mire, into the swamp, uh, and cuts channels and rolls, is what they're called, uh, that are then later infilled by this uh, tidally transported uh, gray mud and silt. So let's take a look at that. This is right very close to that channel margin. And what you're looking at uh, is a sort of pinstripes. Uh, this is thickness, zero to five feet, five to 10, et cetera. Uh, you're seeing sort of pinstripes that are coming through here. Uh, and if you look sort of close, you can see that it's slightly darker here, slightly lighter, slightly darker, slightly lighter. Each one of these packages of dark and light is a, a, a package of, uh, uh, um, sorry, back up. The individual pinstripes are daily tidal cycles. These package, larger packages, are monthly tidal cycles. This is, what do you call that? Five, no, let's make it more than that. Maybe seven to eight feet of sediment in basically four months' time. So it's that sediment is coming in in a hurry. And this, this process is a happening fairly rapidly. And it's happening rapidly because you're creating accommodation space as you put a layer of sediment on top, it squishes the peat down to make more space, to be able to get more space to put more sediment into it. Uh, in fact, we know it's coming in fast. If you take a close look here, uh, you can detect again that pinstriping showing the daily cycles, tidal cycles, and it's slightly closer together. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, let me go back, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the color difference, this monthly cycle, these are neap and spring tides. So the spring tides is where the tidal range is slightly higher. So the, the, the uh, pinstripes are slightly further apart. The neap tides are when the tidals, uh, tidal range is slightly less. So those pinstripes are slightly closer together. That's how you know this is a month. Uh, that's a month through there. So uh, here it is again, slightly tighter together here, slightly further apart. And the most important thing is this is the coal surface here. And if you look off on the left, you'll see that that is an angular contact as it comes down here. That means that this sediment was just absolutely pouring out, out of the channel, uh, out and across uh, the, uh, the, the peat surface. It was coming in in a hurry. Uh, okay, what does that mean? Uh, if you've got a peat swamp that has, that has uh, vegetation on it and you quickly put sediment on it a huge amount in a very short period of time, that's how you preserve a forest. That's how you're able to preserve a large amount of, of vegetation in a very short period of time. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, you end up rotting the stuff away because as soon as the seawater, uh, as soon as seawater or the water it get, uh, gets underwater, specifically with seawater, uh, it's just a matter of time that before it starts to rot and oxidize and turn into just muck. Uh, so you've got to cover it over in a hurry, and this is how you do it. Uh, you don't see the you don't see the, the tidal packages as well in this in this here. I can see it on my screen. You may not be able to see it there, uh, but there are uh, uh, the the daily cycles uh, stacked through there as well with these upright trees. So that's the larger. In a sense, I could stop the talk right here and say that's it, uh, because this gives you the reason why are these things being preserved. It's because you're getting these these the, these large amounts of sediment during deglaciation to to package and preserve these swamps at one time. Uh, and that's how we're able to get this kind of preservation in the roofs of these coal mines. Yeah, that's another great one right there. Uh, okay, well, let's just, I'm gonna take this all the way to the end just because uh, this is the continuation. The, the river channel has now turned into an estuary. You've got these big big sheets of plastics that are moving out, out and across the landscape, uh, covering, uh, well, 
often across the swamp as sea level is coming up. What happens next, and I now we're somewhere up into here in this uh, lozenge, so sea level is rising up here. Uh, at some point, that estuarine system and that this, the uh, shoreline is now miles away. And what begins, to, what happens is you start getting erosion of those gray shale wedges, and the erosion occurs at the margins of these wedges. And what the, the rock that is, that is uh, deposited next uh, is a black shale. It implies anoxic conditions. Uh, the, what, we, what you find is that the organic affinities in the shales uh, trend from terrestrial affinities at the base of these black shales to more marine at the top, reflecting the, the, uh, the uh, origin of the organics and uh, uh, the nature of the or, uh, or origination of those organics in those shales. Uh, so what we see is that the margins of these, of these gray shale wedges, you end up getting uh, gray shale bodies or pods that are eroded out, making these little mud islands with black shale infilling the areas. We'll keep a rising sea level up some more. Oh, I, sorry, here's the example of it. So here's, uh, unfortunately, you really can't see it, the trust that I've, that I've done this correctly. Here's a coal seam down here. Here's one of these eroded gray shale islands there and the black shales in red uh, pinching out on either side, indicating the erosion of that, of that gray shale wedge as sea level continued up. So in the case of the Springfield coal, the Dikersburg uh, shale, what you'll notice is that, uh, oh, sorry, the dark gray is the less, greater than 20, light gray is less than uh, 20 and below, and the blue is the black shales with limestones that uh, sort of sea levels high. What you'll notice is you have situations here where you've actually got black shale right up against the edge of this, this uh, the Galatia channel. Shouldn't that be gray shale? What, what gives? And what you're seeing here is the eroded remnants so the initial body of, of estuarine shales, uh, uh, tidal shales that were covering this area once covered the whole area, but as sea level continued to rise, erosion occurred. And what you have here is the erosional remnant. So last stage, uh, close to the last stage here is you have limestones that are also uh, uh, forming and pinching out against the edges of these gray shale bodies as well. Sea level continues to rise, coastlines get pushed inland, uh, any of those sediment depositors, they continue to follow going that way too. Um, and we've come to the end of that cycle because the next cycle begins as you go back to the next beginning of the next glacial cycle. So there it is in a, in a nutshell, if you will. So the coal deposition in Illinois was controlled by the interplay of climate, sedimentation, and used to see as expressed across the broad flat landscape. And these regular repeating cycles are primarily con controlled by glaciation. So each one of these major packages, we have a coal, the black shale, limestone, gray shales as part of those channel systems. It's the same story over and over. So the heron coal is just another heartbeat in that glacial cycle. The names are different. So with the Springfield coal, it was here with the Dikersburg as the gray shale. Uh, the Anna Shale, or sorry, Turner Mine Shale uh, uh, for the Black Shale, St. David Limestone. In the Heron case, it's the Walshville Channel. Uh, here's the Heron Coal, and it's the Energy Shale. The Energy Shale uh, is what you folks are finding uh, the fossils uh, in at the, at the mine site. It's also the, uh, the facies that we were finding at the Riola and Vermilion Grove mines, uh, the, the preserved fossil forest there. So that, of course, is up in this neck of the woods up here. Uh, here's the Walshville channel as it comes down through like so. We miss it here. And the thought is it may have trended up this way, but it's hard to say because uh, there's, there's an interplay of more than just that going on. And I was gonna show, that's this here. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the uh, distribution of the energy shale. Here is the Walshville channel running through here like so. There's another channel that's cutting down from a higher level. That's that one here. It doesn't, it doesn't come into play here. Uh, adjacent to the channel, you have areas where the gray shale, uh, the energy shale, is thick. That's along here, here, and down through here. You've got another feature here that is also part of our story uh, for the Vermilion Grove and Riola mines and for the, the deposit, uh, the, uh, uh, the spoil pile that you've been working too, uh, is there's a large body here, it's called the Charleston Delta, and uh, a zoomed in view of this is this, it's a, a, actually a scan of a, an older, older work. Here's the Walshville coming off that way, and again, heading up somewhere this way. Here's Vermilion County. 
Uh, this is showing uh, the clastic wedge of the Charleston Delta. Uh, the, uh, the energy shale actually continues further north here. It actually continues up uh, uh, further up this way, but it gets it, it thins out quite a bit. It is, it is possible, we don't really have this story completely sussed out at this point, uh, it, it appears that there may be, um, uh, that this Charleston Delta may be a result of um, sediment that is coming out of the landscape uh, as part of another channel system that was developed uh, further to the west. And we're seeing sort of the distal portions of that sediment flux. It's, it's likely, it's, it, it appears to be contemporaneous with, with the Walshville Channel and its uh, avulsed uh, 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 energy shale, which is what you see over here and here in those areas. Uh, but we think there may be another component to this, which is, which is why it's, um, uh, it seems to be over thickened in these areas. The other thing of interest here too, uh, is that you've got uh, somewhat uh, uh, potentially a uh, tectonic situation and that the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a fault line that runs through here as well trending approximately through here and it may be that there may be a tectonic component that this may have been dropped this may have dropped down somewhat as well to give an over thickened bowl or hole if you will uh, for that energy shale to float to come into okay so the long and short of it the big picture uh, is that you've got a system that is uh, basically being controlled by large-scale changes in climate glacial interglacial cycles that is influencing or controlling eustacy or sea level changes. The, climate, the glaciation is also controlling what sort of climate that, we're, that we exist in or that we have, meaning you're going from seasonal conditions to wet conditions. And it's the interplay of those two things that are painting the landscape, giving us uh, the formation and the death of the heron peat swamp. And for the purposes of uh, the fossils that we that we find, uh, and that storyline, it's the it is the the change in climate, the deglaciation process that allows the sediment to be evulsed out of the landscape, brought down these drainage systems and over and on top of the the peat rapidly that allows for the preservation of those fossils. There we go. That was very exciting. Let's see if that thing will start running. Oh, I guess maybe it didn't. Oh, too bad. Media was not found. <laughs> it's supposed to show a wonderful picture of us leaving the mine uh, as we finish off uh, our talk. So I think with that, uh, I will stop my share, I believe. Or maybe I won't. No, I will stop the share and I'll come back to you. Take it from there and I can reshare again if we need to go back to any of the pictures. And I don't know, uh, Dave or whoever is controlling, I guess, uh, how do we want to do questions? It's open to anybody. Um, I'd actually like to go back to some of the first pictures inside the mine you had. Certainly. Oops. Let's go way back up top. Yeah. Uh, back to here. I'll yeah. go back. Um, it's the next one, actually. Next one. Okay, let me get my little toolbar out of the way there. Right there, and I'll go big. Down at the bottom, yeah. There, it, is there a curved piece down at the bottom, and then under, right under his foot? Oh, here. Yeah. What is that? Uh, <laughs> that is the evidence of why it's not a good idea uh, to hang out for too long <laughs> underneath unsupported roof. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. That's roof falls. What that is. Okay. And then on the next, the very next picture. Got it. Yes. Okay. Over the head, um, the white area. This right up here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I could, I should have uh, included more pictures of the underground environment. I apologize. So this is a roof bolt, and uh, what you're seeing, it's 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 been uh, covered over in rock dust. Uh, actually, I will answer that question. Let me look. Let me point out something else, and I'll get back to it. So. Uh, what you're seeing here is the coal seam, the, the beautiful black bands, the gray shale of the, uh, of the energy shale above or the gray shale above. The white that you see on the walls is limestone dust. And what they do is they, uh, it's a, a fire and explosion retardant, if you will. 
And what is done is that they will uh, spray a slurry of limestone dust and water on the walls and the ceiling and leaving uh, layers of, of limestone dust on the floor so that uh, if there was a coal dust explosion, which you really hope there isn't, uh, that will uh, retard it and keep it from happening. Okay, that diversion is to answer here. This is a, a, a roof bolt that's been covered over by that limestone dust. You can make out a rectangular shape. Uh, that is the sort of the pad, if you will, a metal plate. In the middle of it is a, is a steel bolt. They drill up into the ceiling, put a piece of, um, it's an epoxy tube, epoxy glue tube, shove that up there, put the steel piece of rebar with the plate underneath, shove it up there, twist it around, breaks the seal, the epoxy, and it glues it into place. There's also a, a little clip or a bolt in there that uh, as they twist it, it expands out, uh, uh, sandwiching in place. Uh, the, the concept and idea is that the rocks above the coal seam, especially here, are, the, like, are like lasagna noodles. And what you're doing is putting toothpicks up into the lasagna noodles to keep it, to create a beaming effect. And if you're ever underground, this is where you stand. You stand underneath <laughs> these. <laughs> and it's fascinating, but I'm actually very disappointed because I was really hoping it was some kind of huge center of a bigger gastropod or something. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, it's fascinating, but I'm, I'm part of me is just like. But you're sad. <laughs> I, well, this is, isn't this the nature of everyone who looks for fossils, isn't it, right? <laughs> uh, where you have to find, where you need to go for the, for the marine fossils is in the black shales. Uh, uh, more so there, the like adestus sharks and uh, uh, gastropods, all sorts of good stuff that, that can show up in those. So just out of curiosity, has okay. anybody, you know, I, I, obviously the mining is for the coal and they don't really care about the fossils, but has anybody gone into some of these old mines and started going layer by layer up to, to you know, and really get a history? Because I know, most of the fossils were going down. And it would be kind of interesting to see what the reverse shows. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, well, it's a multi, multi part answer. Um, the, the I'll give you the, let me give you the practical, realistic answer first. <laughs> and that is, uh, I would not go into, I personally would never go into one of these mines that was not being actively um, maintained. These, uh, as the seasons, our seasons, not the season, seasonality I was talking about, as you go from winter to summer, humidity changes, the air that comes in there then oscillates between drier and wetter. The clays that are inside those gray shales feel that dry and wet, they expand and contract. And that expansion and contraction means that it, you start uh, peeling, the, the roof just peels away. It just peels away rapidly and it's really a, in fact, you get a sense of it here. Uh, you see how the, the plate itself is actually just this, what is that? Uh, call it a quarter of an inch thick. What you see above there is actually a gray shale. What that means is that when this bolt was first put in place, that was the original roof line. And since that point, it is, what is that? Call that four inches? Four inches of roof has peeled away in the meantime. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's so so uh, it's really not something you can do to go back into these old mines to be able to, to harvest safely. Mm -hmm. But to get more specifically to your question of, you know, can you do a systematic sampling and analysis of this? Yes, you can, but you can't do it on a mine wide basis. You get a block out uh, or you have a large block that you're able to get. At a surface mine, you have the opportunity to do that. And obviously it's an excavation problem because you've got, you know, a big area to go across. By and large, when you're in these mines, you're looking at these sort of instantaneous deposits. And of course, as you go through the mine, you're not really at one horizon. You're sort of going up and down as you go. But from the standpoint of when this uh, deposit was formed, keep in mind that you know the sediment that you're looking at there from the, the top of the coal there up you know, a foot, uh, that could be as little as a month. So by, for all intents and purposes, it's essentially an instantaneous deposit. You're encapsulating it all in place at once. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess I'll keep this up and I'll just glance off to the right uh, for other questions or as people pipe up. 
I got one more and then I'll let somebody else take a chance. <laughs> is the that tree chunk right that we see right there? Is yeah. that in the uh, lignite layer? Uh, so okay. the, the way to envision this, and let me go back to the picture before. Oops, hang on. There it goes. Nope. Uh, I'm going too far. I want to go the other way. There it is. So uh, you can see how this this tree here, see how it flares out at the base on either side? Mm -hmm. What we're looking at in the next picture is a much larger version of that. So we are standing here looking up at that flared out base. That's the flared out base. So this is actually, and actually you kind of get a hint of it here. Uh, it looks like this is sort of attaching in to the coal seam. It's been removed, but this flared out base would have rooted into the top layer, uh, the top of this coal seam right here. Okay. Yeah. There's there's other interesting things. Another, another talk for another time uh, is uh, there are uh, things called coal balls and coal balls are mi uh, per mineralizations of peat. Specifically, it's a per, it's um, uh, per mineralizing the peat before it gets compacted. And you can take these, these coal balls, you can then uh, chop them in half. You can put a, 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 an acetate uh, P, oh, sorry, a layer of acetate on top of that half, put acetone on top, partially melts it, peel it away, and you, you end up getting, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to, I can share this actually. Uh, maybe I won't, uh, we'll get back to it. If, if, at the very end, if people want to see what a cobalt peel looks like, I will show it then. Uh, but there's a whole other talk to, to talk about, about who was in this swamp, and those cobalts tell you who was there. Uh, and it's cool because uh, this climate change story that I was talking about, it's, re it's reflected in the vegetation. Uh, there's a change in vegetation that occurs right at the very top here from uh, these um, uh, per humid plants to seasonal, seasonally based plants. And the, 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 the key species in this is Sigillaria. Sigillaria is not very common, um, relatively speaking, not very common down in the coal seam, but it dominates in the roof shales. And it's a signature of that climate change. I think that's really cool. Okay, there we go. Thank you. You're very welcome. A little question. Uh, this is Don. Yeah. One of the notorious problems with Illinois coal is sulfur. Yes. Uh, when we're up on one of these hills, uh, a spoil pile, you can find lumps of coal that actually just encased in uh, muddy type sulfur, yeah. maybe a few inches thick. Uh, what brings the sulfur into this and where's the sulfur form? Oh, that's a great question. And another talk for another time, but I'll give you the, 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 uh, the down and dirty version. Uh, so wait, hold on. I can actually get to some of this. Uh, Oh no, hold on. Let me go back to to uh, the, no. Actually, we'll go. We'll go with we'll go with this one here. Okay, so two places that the um, the sulfur comes from, and the reason why I'm I'm going to go to here. Uh, the dark gray is is where the gray that gray shale, the rapidly accumulating shale, is over 20 feet thick. That is also where you tend to find lower sulfur coal. One of, the, one of the ways that you end up getting uh, sulfur into the, um, uh, into, the, into the peat is through seawater infiltration. So when the gray shale, that big thick body of gray shale is over 20 feet, uh, the idea is that it likely created a buffer from seawater penetration such that the, sulfur, the sulfate in the seawater was not able to get into the peat. There's something else though too, and that is the type of peat swamp this is. Uh, these are large, flat, planar peat bodies, and the pHs of these big, flat uh, 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 peat bodies tends to be closer to neutral than it is to very acidic. And this is in contrast uh, to the coals in the Appalachians. Um, the coals in the Appalachians are, 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 quite, are often uh, very low sulfur, uh, and they also tend to be more domed peat deposits, higher rainfall, and they tend to be these big domed peats. Uh, and the acidity of those peats tends to be fairly high. 
that has then a, a that correlates then to the bacterial communities that are present in those systems. When you have fairly neutral pHs or close to neutral, that is, it's still acidic, but closer to neutral, uh, the um, uh, what do they call this? The the uh, sulfur-loving bacteria. There's a name for it, and it's out of my head. Just happened. Anyway, uh, they're able to proliferate and they're able to to make a living in those conditions. And the highly acidic conditions, like the coals out in the Appalachians, uh, you know, pH is like in the twos and things like that. Uh, those uh, sulfur uh, con sulfur uh, uh, um, producing and, and utilizing bacteria cannot make a go of it at all. So the background levels of sulfur in the peats is a function of the pH of the initial deposit, which is how you get the difference between the dome peats versus the planar flood like or the planar peats. And for, for us in the Illinois basin, uh, seawater infiltration. So our low sulfur is like 0.8%. That is high sulfur for the Appalachians. Our high sulfurs can be up in the four, five, six percent range. If you look at the western coals, the lignites and the uh, subbituminous out of mm -hmm. Wyoming, yeah. you're talking 0.8, and that's planar coal. Um, and they're very, very thick theme, seams, up to 50 feet. Uh, that's right. They, they, those those coals are over big areas, but they're not over. They're not the same. You know, the the herring coal that we see here is that seam is traceable all the way from uh, Delaware out to uh, the western Kansas. Uh, these these were truly monstrous uh, truly monstrous in terms of uh, extent uh, for where they were. Uh, but yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, hi Scott, Andrew Young, nice to see you again. Oh, nice to see you, there you go, hi. Hey, uh, great talk, and, and I, I should mention uh, to all of us who uh, worked with you on that um, 2012 Fauna book and saw the Cyclothem chart, um, I believe you said it was unpublished at the time, so I wanna thank you for lending it to our club. Uh, yes. To put it in our book, that was magnificent. Yeah. So I have just a couple quick questions. Um, it seemed to me when you were talking about the um, the Milankovitch cycles, um, did I interpret it correctly that a an elliptical orbit was conducive to glacial intervals? It is a mixture. I'm going to hunt, hunt for it right now. Where do we go? You're there talking we go. about the, the zones, the, uh, tropical, the, inter, the tropical zones charts. A couple slip frames down. Down here. Yeah. Got it. Uh, the um, the elliptical it's multiple. Uh, there are so you end up getting. Uh, it seems like the main. This is a. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as a fast explanation of Milankovitch cycles, but of these various cycles, they can constructively and de destructively interfere with each other, such that you can get you can get greater excursions uh, that happen on these hundred thousand year intervals that are happening. With the under you know, so multiple heartbeats, when they all heartbeat at the same time, you end up getting a bigger excursion. When you have the, the lesser of a heartbeat, uh, then you can get a lesser of an excursion. The hundred thousand is a big one because you end up getting um, the the uh, um, more elliptical orbits. So you end up getting uh, uh, with the more elliptical orbit, you end up getting the Earth, relatively speaking, further away from the Sun in general than it would be with a more circular orbit. Uh, but at the same time, you also have, I always get the, uh, the precession as well, and the obliquity uh, that, that superimposes onto it. That's, this, that's why it's at a the 44K to 100K sort of a time frame. And now, there's, there's uncertainty in that Eros paper from 2012. Um, they have a plus or minus, I think, of 10 or 20,000 years on it. But they're, they're, that, that cyclicity that they see there is right in the same, um, the same window of this, this uh, 40 to 100K cycle. So, so in, the, um, in the glacial intervals uh, with the constant wetness, et cetera, it, it suggests sort of a stasis. But when I saw the elliptical orbit, that seemed sort of non-static. It seemed in terms of proximity <laughs> oh, that's a great point. to the sun. And that's what was confusing. That, that's a great point. Or counterintuitive. What, you're looking, what you're looking at here, of course, is, uh, is, a, is a year. Uh, so on average for that year, um, 
uh, well, <laughs> you're ready for a set, your, uh, your, your sound effect for the evening. Uh, here's the sound effect of um, uh, speed, relative speed. Uh, my cursor is the, is the earth and this is relative speed. So ready, we'll start on this side, we'll go around here. So ready, right, okay. So <laughs> the idea is that the closer the earth is to the sun, the faster it's moving. So this time interval here, you know, three months. And this is the remainder of the time. So on average, you're further away. Great. Um, thank you. Um, absolutely. Also, very, very quick question, just on terminology. When you were talking about the tidal banding, and it's fascinating that you can keep a record of like literally every neap and spring tide. Um, you, you, you never used the term tidal rhythmite. Is that still I, I didn't. Right? Tidal is rhythmite is correct. Term? Oh, tidal rhythmite. Okay. Yeah, tidal rhythmite is the term. I, I did not. I didn't use it. I sh I should have. In fact, in fact, did I even say it in here someplace? Maybe I didn't. No. Well, it's I such a lo it's such a lovely term. <laughs> it is. You know, I, I, I like... have an affection for it. So, so it's like it's like when I when I missed it when you were talking about it. Uh, yeah, it implies dancing somehow, doesn't it? And then my last question, and I'll, and I'll move on, is a very esoteric one. Um, Bruce Lauer was talking earlier about visiting Lyme Regis, England, and collecting fossils earlier. Um, uh, some of us went to Whitby, England, and collected some jet on, on the uh, seashore. And I wanted to know where in the sort of scheme of peat, lignite, coal, anthracite, <laughs> graphite, where does jet fall in that? So uh, you're catching me off guard because I actually, I, I used to know this better. So I apologize. I have to give this a, a hand wavy response. My recollection uh, is that that jet is a it's not a distillate, but it's a um, it's a, it's like a it's like a refractory process within the the peat formation sequencing, um, and I don't I don't honestly remember what that I don't honestly remember where it sits within that. But it's a, it's like it's like a hydrocarbon refractory sort of a of a of a distillation. And I'll have to punt on that. I don't remember the rest of it. So it seems some, something radical in a way. I mean, because we're talking about time and pressure, and there seems to be almost like a um, like a sequential experience going to ultimately graphite. I guess right, the purest um, form of carbon in that regard. And I don't know where jet falls on that chemically. Yeah, and I don't I don't remember where it fits in if it's a. Um, what I don't remember if it's a, a function of the initial plant constituents, or is it um, uh, is it a function of heat and pressure? And that I don't remember. I don't remember. I'll have to, I'll have to get back to I get back to Dave on it because I have Dave's email. <laughs> and then I, I guess I did have one little auxiliary auxiliary question because yeah. when you were talking about the um, uh, uh, many of us here have been to the uh, Catlin spoil pile and have collected some magnificent fossils there. Yeah. And for the longest time, we were just saying this is in the, the energy shale, you know, the roof shale of the Heron Coal. Yeah. But um, Jack Witchery suggested in our last um, visit that there was some other event, like you suggested, maybe a, a faulting event that brought that other incursion of sediments. So it may not be called the energy shale after all, could be called something else. Uh, so this is where you get into the, uh, the, you know, how do you name a geologic formation question? And um, when you when you put, when you're ascribing a name to a body of rock, it ends up being a function of um, self similarity, mappability, to a certain extent, uh, the genetics of it. In other words, the origin of it also has, plays a role as well. The sediment, the origin of that sediment, is happening within the same large scale depositional system. It's, it's happening during a deglaciation event. Um, it is sediment that is coming out of the landscape during this, during this uh, uh, deglaciation. Um, you, it, I think what you would do is you, you would still call it energy shale. You might have a, a sub of the energy shale, call it a something member perhaps, but you'd have to map it out uh, to be able to, to really define it and call it that. But it's fair enough to say roof shale, heron coal roof shale is absolutely is, covers all the bases. Yep. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you again, Scott. Wonderful. Fantastic. Story. Yes. So this picture that's on here right now. Yeah. 
that just blows me away that those are daily deposit. Is there, oh, yeah. any, is there any place right now currently that you can see the same heavy daily sediment deposits? I mean, yeah, that's, so, I mean, cause that's, you're looking at that section and that's like <laughs> a couple of months and it's yeah. like, Man, I tell you, uh, what's the phrase, you know, uh, geology or the, the rocks that we see, you know, uh, you know, the vast majority of geologic time is not represented by anything at all. It's just all lacunas and all we're catching are these brief snippets of deposition. You know, uh, a hole is filled and once it's filled, then it's filled and the sediment goes somewhere else to be filled. Uh, so that's one aspect of it is that you're, you, you've got a, you have an event that has occurred that's created a space. We call it accommodation space, a place to put stuff. As it gets filled in and once it's filled in, then the sediment, eh, it's gonna go find the next lowest spot. Uh, and then as that sediment depot center moves off somewhere else, then it may be static and has seen nothing for the next 900, you know, 90,000 years until the next cycle comes through. Cause I'm used to tree <laughs> rings being like a year and I'm used to, you know, seeing layers and rocks and it's like, Oh, that's a million years, three million. And so when you yeah, say yeah. daily, my mind just went. And, and this one even should be even more so because in this case, you know, a month here is about through here. You know, these are daily cycles that are coming through there. That's, that's a couple inches. And when you yeah. see the angle, I mean, that stuff is, you know, the, the coal, uh, the peat surface, the swamp surface is like that. And this is sediment that's just rocketing in angular. Uh, that that's to me is a, a mind boggler as well uh, to show you how fast it's coming. But to answer your question, where else would you see this happening today? Um, you can see tidal rhythmites. There you go, Andrew. Uh, do you see tidal rhythmites today being deposited like up in, uh, was it Turnigan, Turnigan Bay up in Alaska? Where you have- Turnigan Arms. Turn, yeah, thank you. Uh, where you have, you know, large tidal ranges and you can get, you know, erosion that occurs to make a hole that can be filled in rather quickly over a period of time, and then it shifts off somewhere else, and then it's preserved, and then it might be re-eroded again. So, so how did you date process. it to know it was a daily? How, how is that? How is was that possible to know that that's a day, not a month or something? What's yeah, the date? I'll put another angle on too. So, uh, oh gosh, wait. I wonder if I can um, hold on. Let me. Uh, let me stop this share and let me share my screen. This, this shows you, this is uh, how intimate I am with you now is that I'll, I'll let you see my desktop. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can pull out, let me pull this, put you guys over here for a second. Let me see, where is that? Cause I wanna show you, uh, shoot, where did that go? Um, wait, I may need to go into, let me go into this here because I, I what I want to show you is is a really good oh, I think it's here pictures. Oh no, that's not it. Oh, it's this one. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so cool. All right. So this is a mind boggler, too. You see that right there? That is an upright tree. And uh, before this fell down, when we talked to uh, the, the, head, the geologist on the mine site, that headed up almost 50 feet from the floor, which is covered over here at the bottom, uh, all the way up to the top. Wow. So how long would a tree exist in standing water without degrading? It's not going to last more than how many years? You know, decades, mm -hmm. perhaps. So that is a huge volume of sediment in a very short period of time, trapping a, a, a tree, upright tree, 50 feet. That's just staggering. I, that's, that to me is one of the most amazing pictures uh, to, to me anyway. And I think, I've, I wonder if I've got, um, no, I don't, uh, I'll have to, I don't have it, I don't have it uh, ready to go, unfortunately, but um, I have another picture that takes a close up look at this. And you can see that you can see that the daily cycles, boom, 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 boom. Oh, here's another mind boggler too on these rhythmites. Uh, the uh, you can count up, you know, these neat, these daily packages and the neap spring uh, uh, neap spring cycles, and determine how many days there were in a month, a lunar month. 
in this case. Mm -hmm. So today, what is it? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get this right. It's something like, what is it, 28 days in a lunar month? I don't know, 27, 28? Yes. Yeah, 28. Okay. okay. Uh, if my memory serves, and this is hand wavy, so you don't quote me, I think it's something like 25 uh, for a lunar month in the Pennsylvania. You can find situations where these tidal rhythmites are preserved um, in the Precambrian, where it's like 17 days to a lunar month. Why? Mm. Because when you go further back in time, the moon was closer to the Earth, so it went around the Earth faster, hence the lunar cycles. Anyway, is that cool? I think that's amazing. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. That is cool. That is, I love that. Uh, okay, so uh, let me see if I can get that back up again. There we go. All right. I'll just keep it like this. No need to go anywhere beyond that. So does that rapid sedimentation that, that you were just talking about facilitate the formation of siderite concretions in those roof shales? So my understanding is it has to be a low sulfur environment um, so that uh, the sulfate's not competing uh, with carbonate for the iron, right? So in the Mason Creek, you know, you get the, this amazing preservation in these siderite concretions, right? And, but, but the story you told initially, I was like, well, how does that work? Because you've got the sea levels rising, you know, overtopping the banks, right? And so mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't that lead to higher sulfate in those environments? So how do we get those siderite concretions in the gray shales that um, lie still, over top of the coal? You're still getting, you're still getting, uh, so sea level, or sea water is coming in. You're still getting infiltration. Uh, so the the your your primary chemical constituents are still available uh, to to form. Only the only time that you're getting uh, a reduction in the amount of sulfur in the coal as a proxy here is when the gray shale is monstrously thick. Uh, well, monstrously uh, over twenty feet thick. Right. Uh, and uh, the the thought then is that uh, that those thicker shales are providing a buffer, not zero, but it's providing a buffer to the amount that's able to come in. Does that make sense in terms of? Uh... It, it does, although when, but when the, the shale first formed, presumably there, the sulfur was present in the seawater there as well, right? Oh, I mean, the oh, sediment's well, coming in with the seawater, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So that's the other part. I didn't emphasize this. Uh, wait, hold on. I can come back here. So initially you're getting, you're getting tidal bores that are working their way upriver. But it's a you've got a competition between freshwater coming down, seawater coming up. So uh, as this system is transgressed, you've got fresh inland salt, uh, not inland, outland, <laughs> sea, <laughs> seaward, uh, and uh, and of course a mixing zone in between. Uh, and overall, the uh, um, uh, that whole system is is prograding or transgressing uh, inward. Uh, so your initial, let me go back here, your, your initial, uh, uh, your initial gray shales that are being deposited are in a much fresher regime than they are salty. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So if we look um, somewhere to the west of Mazan Creek, but still above the Colchester Coal, if you go about 20 miles west out to uh, Starved Rock, um, at the Starved Rock Clay Pit. There's a lot of uh, uh, shale over the coal. The coal is quite thin there, but the concretions there are not formed right. And I presume that's a more marine environment. Uh, deeper water at would have been, uh, the water would have come back in more quickly at that point. That could be what the, 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 the... The hand wavy aspect of it is, uh, by the way, this is the Francis Creek shale uh, uh, thickness, the, the, the gray shale facies of the, for the Colchester uh, heartbeat, if you will. The thing that we're struggling with is the erosion. We don't, we don't know how extensive and how thick the initial deposit was because it has been subsequently eroded. Uh, so it's difficult to weave it. You can weave a story for sure, uh, but uh, it, but we're hamstrung uh, by we're hamstrung by not knowing the initial original dimensions. 
so this for the Francis Creek, but to, but to pop back to the Springfield coal for a second, uh, that's what I was emphasizing here is that, you know, here's the trace of the Galatia channel and yet you've got black shale and no gray shale next to the channel whatsoever. How is that, how could that be the case? And that's because we've got an erosional remnant. Uh, it, is, it is likely coming to here, it, the, the initial gray shale wedge, this big, huge body was, was massively extensive laterally. So this probably wow. went out, you know, miles and miles and miles away from, the, from, that, from that channel. And of course, uh, uh, you know, where those, uh, where those uh, clastic bodies are gonna go on, the, on that landscape, they are generally going to be thickest, closest to the channels, but you can get situations like with the Charleston Delta and the energy shale, where you get another system that is also evulsing out and, and creating Delta uh, packages too. But it's then been subsequently eroded as sea level has come up. So we've got an erosional remnant and are piecing it together off of that. So it's hard, it's hard to, you can, you'll have to tell a just so story to get it. Uh, and, and we're hamstrung by that. Yeah, I guess I would add that uh, out at uh, Starved Rock, there there's a a very thick layer of black shale on top of the whole thing. So yes, um, if that gray shale was eroded, it happened before the deposition of the black shale. Absolutely, it's all, it's all one unit now, and and I think that black shale is the only thing that kept the glaciers from ripping it all off <laughs> and moving it. Yeah, there's been instances uh, in the with the uh, uh, at surface mines where you can see. Um, large upright trees that are encapsulated in gray shale that are then planed off uh, after, you know, it's two feet of shale and that's it. And it's part of, you know, an erosional remnant and then black shale encasing everything else. So again, that's, that's giving you the stepwise, you know, what happened one after another. Um, so yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Can you use the number of uh, cyclothems to, to judge time? Can we use the number of cyclothems to judge the amount of time between the Colchester and the Heron Coles? You, you, you uh, before this study, the Aero study in 2012, where you had the intercalated uh, um, uh, volcanic ashes where you could get absolute dates, you absolutely could put a, 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 a rhythm marker on it and you could guess, assuming that those were glacial interglacial cycles and say, oh, well, that's probably this many years. With that study, you can put a much more definitive on that and say, yes, yeah, you can say approximately how much time has gone by uh, with those, with those uh, stratigraphic markers. So uh, 10 years ago, the answer would have been, yeah, we can take a good guess. Now you can take a much, much better guess uh, because of those uh, uh, correlations that have been able to uh, take place from the Donetsk Basin uh, over to the Illinois Basin. Short answer, yes. So if there's four cyclothems in between, there's four coals, so there's four cyclothems. So is it 400,000 years outside? Uh, it, well, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little more. So there are other, so from example, from the, uh, the strength, let me see if I can get that even bigger, hold on. I need to move this this way so I can see it because everybody else's face is on that side. Um, here we go, Colchester down here. We got the Cervant, Hoochin Creek, Springfield, Briar Hill, and Heron. Uh, the assumption probably is that uh, the Colchester to the Cervant would be uh, one cycle. Cervant uh, to Hoochin would be another, potentially. The Cervant here in Illinois is not well developed, better developed in Indiana. Uh, and then to the Springfield would be another. Briar Hill might be one of the, those other, uh, not the 100,000, but the 44 potentially, uh, and then the Heron. So you could say uh, 100, another 100, make that 200, 300, maybe 400, but it, you're, you don't know for sure because, you're, uh, because you are, um, uh, you, you don't know how much, you don't know what the Briar Hill represents within that cyclicity. What you can do, and I don't have that in front of me right now, but you can go back and use the correlations that was in that Eros paper. And uh, Isabel Montanez has another paper as well where she's done correlations as well with absolute time. Uh, and you can get some absolute time markers off of that. Uh, uh, send me an email to remind me that, that if you're interested in what that might be, and I can send you the links to that, uh, to that paper uh, and get some, some numbers off of that. Okay. Scott? Yes. 
the other thing is uh, you're talking about the moon being closer. Uh, it's a combination of the moon being closer and the earth having a, a faster rotation. Uh, conservation of angular momentum. So as the moon moves out, transfer of, uh, transfer of angular momentum means that the earth is slowing down in its rotation. So it's kind of a combination of uh, longer, well, the, the days are essentially uh, shorter mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the moon being uh, closer. It's, it's a, it has to do with the angular momentum, the transfer of it. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of cool papers that on that, uh, I can't remember where I saw them, that, that put, uh, gosh, who was it? Um, Al Archer and, uh, I can't remember his other name now. Anyway, uh, that put together a story on those the the tidal rhythmites through time, and I, I I believe that's correct. I think that's part of that storyline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The other thing is about we're talking about the Milankovitch cycles. Um, when I taught it at school, I always the hundred thousand year eccentricity is is the most important, but the the precession is a modifier because depending we all know that the tilt of the axis gives us the seasons. When the north, uh, when northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, uh, we get summer. However, right now we're tilted away, and we're going to be getting winter. But in January, the early part of January, first week in January, I think we're actually closer to the sun than at any other time during our year. It just happens the way the precession is right now that in our winter we're actually three million miles, give or take, closer to the sun than an average. So the, the precession does have a bit, the, the change in the uh, tilt of the axis, I, I never thought it had much to do with it at all. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's cool stuff. It really it is. is. That, Milankovitch was, at that time, thinking up of that, the, the uh, uh, orbital uh, uh, controls, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. I, I love these animations too. <laughs> if you folks don't mind, I'm going to stop recording at this point. We're getting a little <laughs> long, but please do continue talking and asking questions. Yeah. <laughs>